First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this 6G Wireless Foundation Forum for their invitation to give this talk and to share some of our recent interest and studies uh, with the audience of this forum. Uh, so I would like to take advantage of this opportunity uh, to present our views on extreme bandwidth communication and more precisely on terahertz and the free space optic communication system and how they can uh, collaborate and coexist with current RF technologies in order to offer ubiquitous high rate wireless communication in 6G dense networks. And uh, obviously, the motivation behind this work is that uh, as we start deploying 5G in several countries, uh, many researchers worldwide have started already brainstorming and planning for what uh, should 6G be. Uh, this is natural move since over the last decade, uh, we have seen that it took us essentially about 10 years to design, develop and deploy one generation of wireless networks and it take us another 10 years to start using it extensively until you know, it matures and eventually it retires and we move to the next G. So no, now going back to 6G, clearly the vision is how this beyond 5G or 6G networks will push the envelope and target higher speeds, more user capacity and lower latency for a variety of emerging and shooter application displayed in the slide in front of you. But going back to uh, basics, we need uh, to understand that we are dealing with a congested RF spectrum. Indeed, spectrum is a natural resource that is getting more and more scarce. And uh, as such, RF spectrum user is typically uh, in every single country regulated and optimized in view of the variety of competing applications ranging from radio, TV broadcasting, uh, defense and public safety kind of uh, needs, as well as, uh, of course, commercial services to the public, uh, including voice data streaming, as we have seen over the last few decades. And uh, when we talk about uh, uh, a spectrum, we are dealing or we are essentially uh, uh, talking about the lower part of the RF spectrum, but the, the spectrum is uh, much wider than that. It includes, uh, uh, you know, um, the terahertz spectrum between RF and optical, and there is also, of course, the optical part of the spectrum that uh, we can take advantage of. So in this context, uh, I would like uh, to focus uh, in this talk on this uh, extreme bandwidth communication system as a potential solution to alleviate uh, the spectrum scarcity problem that we are dealing with uh, and uh, we can say that even the, the spectrum deficit problem uh, that we may face in the future if we limit ourselves to the lower part of the RF spectrum. Let us start with the terahertz band, which is uh, the last unexplored piece of the RF spectrum sandwich uh, as I mentioned earlier, between the microwave and optical bands. Hence, uh, technologies from both sides are being explored to support terahertz communication. Uh, the major contribution to terahertz technology are still uh, at the device level rather than the system level. High frequency electromagnetic radiation is perceived either as waves that get treated via electronic devices, and that's kind of in the millimeter wave area, or as particles that uh, get processed via photonic device, and here we are talking uh, uh, in the optical photonic type of uh, uh, expertise. So if you look at electronic solution, which are mainly based on CMOS and Silicon Germanium BCMOS technologies, uh, they have demonstrated incredible compactness and compatibility with existing fabrication processes. However, the, let's say, corresponding highest unity current gain frequency and unity maximum available power gain frequency remain at uh, 280 gigahertz uh, to 320 gigahertz, uh, respectively. 
So uh, nevertheless, uh, higher operating frequencies have been noted or obtained by using other type of semiconductors for some kind of uh, transistors and diode designs. Now, on the other hand, for the photonic devices, uh, uh, where the main design and driver, I would say, is the data rate, higher carrier frequency are supported, but the degrees of integration and output power are relatively low. So frequencies beyond 300 gigahertz have been supported using, let's say, uh, you know, optical down conversion system, quantum cascade lasers, and few other kind of techniques. Now, what is also gaining popularity is plasmonic solution, where novel uh, plasmonic materials such as graphene uh, possesses high electron mobility and reconfigurability. So the resulting uh, surface plasmon Polariton, uh, SPP in short waves, in plasmonic antenna have much smaller resonant wavelength than free space waves, which results in compact and flexible design. So uh, by leveraging uh, properties of plasmonic nanomaterials and nanostructure, transceivers and uh, even antennas that interestingly operate at terahertz frequencies can be created uh, and this avoids the up conversion and down conversion losses uh, that we have to go through when you use electronic and photonic system uh, respectively. So bottom line, uh, all these advances show that the gaps uh, to design terahertz technology are, are rapidly closing and that the terahertz band will soon open for everyday application not only for communication application, but as a, let's say, whole package, uh, enabling uh, kind of the piggybacking aspect on terahertz wave for communication, localization, as well as a more traditional imaging purpose uh, that are uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, very suited for terahertz frequencies. So what, what are the advantages of uh, terahertz communication? Of, of, uh, obviously, when you compare them to millimeter wave, uh, they will promise uh, uh, the terabit per second that we are all looking after for 6G type of application. They have higher di directionality and small footprint. Uh, they are less susceptible to free space diffraction and enter antenna interference. And uh, of course, because of the narrow beam characteristic, they have higher resilience to eavesdropping. And uh, in a way, uh, they differ from s uh, free space optic in the sense that they are less affected by, uh, you know, uh, ambient light uh, kind of noise. Uh, they are less affected by atmospheric turbulence and scintillation, as well as uh, sandstorms. Uh, of course, uh, both free space optics and terahertz require uh, quite tight uh, uh, pointing, acquisition, and tracking, but uh, for terahertz it's less delicate. FSO tends to be a uh, narrower beam that we have to deal with. And uh, with terahertz we can exploit reflection and array processing, uh, that kind of uh, uh, coming from the expertise we acquired from RF and millimeter wave communication systems. One key aspect that uh, we have to emphasize when we talk about terahertz communication is the channel modeling aspect. Obviously, channel modeling is essential for efficient signal processing in any band, and in particular in the terahertz band. So accurate terahertz channel models should consider uh, the effect of both the spreading loss and the molecular absorption loss, and should account for the line of sight, long line of sight, reflected, uh, scattered, and even diffracted signals. So channel modeling approaches are mainly uh, deterministic or statistical. So while deterministic channel models use computationally extensive ray tracing techniques to capture site geometry, statistical uh, modeling represents each independent subchannel by a random variable of a specific distribution. Uh, and one can also uh, use hybrid type of channel modeling where we can combine the advantages of both approaches uh, and in this case, essentially, dominant paths are captured deterministically and the other paths are, uh, let's say, statistically generated. So if you look at the slide here, uh, uh, you, you know, if you adopt, uh, let's say, statistical channel modeling approach that is uh, very suitable for performance analysis type of uh, studies, uh, you, you need uh, to take into account the usual kind of uh, uh, effect, like the path loss, 
including spreading and molecular absorption losses, large-scale fading such as shadowing, the blockage effect that were there in millimeter wave and more accentuated in terahertz, pointing errors that are uh, again probably there in millimeter wave but more accentuated in the terahertz uh, domain, and of course, uh, although it is not critical but still uh, there, small-scale fading uh, due to multipath in the terahertz. So if you look at this equation, that's uh, that's capturing uh, basically all the parameters that need to be taken into account in your channel model. The path loss seen by a terahertz signal uh, in the presence of water vapor is dominated by spikes that represent the molecular absorption losses originating at uh, specific uh, resonant frequencies due to um, excited uh, molecule vibrations. So um, higher densities of absorbing molecules uh, make the peak stronger and wider, uh, you know, this broadening of absorption lines. And because of these lines, the spectrum gets divided into smaller windows, subbands, as you see uh, in the figure in front of you. Uh, and each of these subbands has a width of tens or hundreds of gigahertz. So uh, again, as you see in the figure in front of you, these windows are distance dependent since some spikes only get significant at specific distance by increasing the distance, uh, you know, let's say from one meter to 10 meters as, as we have here, the transmission windows are reduced by order of magnitude. Hence, variation in the communication distance affect both the available bandwidth and the path loss. So what we are saying here, the available bandwidth shrinks at higher frequencies. So if you look at the formula of the molecular absorption front of you, uh, it's a very simple formula where Kf is the absorption coefficient, F is the frequency of operation, and D is the distance between the transmitter and receiver. This absorption coefficient is derived as a summation of the contribution from isotope, you know, the I here, uh, going from one to capital I uh, of gases, and you can have multitude of gases. Uh, uh, and these isotopes of gases basically constitute the medium of interest. So it's a quite complex uh, uh, formula that depends on different kind of uh, parameters such as uh, temperature, pressure, and and so on. But uh, actually, uh, the you know in the case when essentially the water vapor dominates uh, the absorption loss, uh, and this happens at high frequencies. Uh, a simplified and yet a quite accurate model for molecular absorption has been developed uh, and this uh, uh, model uh, is built uh, in a database approach uh, by feeding the absorption line shape function to the actual responses so and that's typically used in in publication of course uh, in the terahertz range, range uh, we need to deal uh, with the blockage in a way that is more uh, significant uh, than in the millimeter wave range. And uh, one way to uh, mitigate the effect of blockage is to put access point at the higher altitude and to deploy multiple access point uh, with a specific user association schemes, uh, you know, that can go by basically by the nearest access point or uh, basically by the access point that gives the best line of sight type of condition. Finally, uh, the performance of terahertz communication system is also severely degraded under the effect of misalignment and hardware impairment, including, for instance, in-phase and quadrature imbalance and non-linearities. So for these hardware imperfections at the transmitter and receiver, typically we just can model them as two additional distortion noises. Now, for misalignment, it occurs when the transmitter and the receiver do not perfectly point to each other, uh, which is highly probable with narrow terahertz beam and all sorts of vibration that can affect either the transmitter or receiver or both of them. Now, uh, from a modeling perspective, due to the symmetry of the beam, the misalignment fading component depends only on the radial distance. Uh, and um, like a terahertz misalignment fading model uh, that is being used these days is based on the famous uh, 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 model by Farid and Harmovic, uh, used or developed in the context of free space optics and which kind of model the receiver intensive fluctuation uh, given in the formula in front of you. And basically assumes identical and independent Gaussian distribution uh, uh, vibration for both horizontal and elevation displacement and uh, 
the receive rate list plane follow as such uh, a Rayleigh distribution again under the 2D up and down, left, right, uh, independent vibration or shaking kind of assumption. To wrap up this discussion on terahertz communication, uh, let me go th briefly th through some of the interesting uh, uh, research direction in this area. Uh, starting by this uh, fragmented spectrum uh, aspect, and in, in, in that context, modulation scheme uh, can be further optimized to utilize this fragmented terahertz bandwidth, not only to mitigate the absorption effect, but also to turn it into an advantage. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the terahertz channel is distance uh, uh, dependent, and as such, we can develop distance over multi carrier schemes that dynamically optimize transmission window allocation uh, accordingly. Of course, these schemes come at the expense of a slightly increased complexity. You will need a feedback channel uh, to, rec you know, to control uh, uh, the multi carrier modulator at the transmitter. Uh, on, from, on the other hand, the terahertz beam are expected to be narrow and their high antenna gain and the corresponding delay spread is reduced. So we are dealing with basically a flat fading channel. So this does not require really OFDM. Actually, OFDM is probably still too complex to implement in the context of uh, ultra broadband and ultra fast terahertz system. Uh, you know, we, we, to my best knowledge, we still don't have uh, complex transceivers, uh, digital to analog uh, converter, analog digital converter uh, with terabit per second digital processor uh, capabilities. Uh, on the top of that, as you know, uh, tight, uh, let's say, frequency synchronization and uh, peak to average power ratio requirement make OFDM not really the optimal solution for terahertz. Uh, now, the limitation also of this digital to analog converter and analog digital converter further prevent the generation of multiband orthogonal systems. So in this context, uh, probably single carry modulation for above 90 gigahertz is a good starting point. Uh, you, and uh, essentially uh, starting, let's say, with pulse-based terahertz communication can achieve uh, the desired terabit uh, per second data rate that we are after. Uh, finally, and one interesting other direction, uh, given the very short wavelength that we are dealing with, we can go towards the so-called ultra-massive MIMO system, the system that use array of subarrays, where beamforming is happening at the level of antenna elements and when multiplexing can happen at the level of subarrays. I believe I'm running out of time, so let me wrap up my talk by uh, briefly talking about free space optics, uh, which is another technology that can uh, deliver the target one terabit per second in an, uh, over an unlicensed uh, optical part of the spectrum. Uh, of course, uh, FSO comes with its own channels, in particular uh, uh, its sensitivity to weather condition, and here I'm talking about fog and also the tight uh, positioning uh, alignment and tracking requirement that comes with FSO. But uh, what I would like to say is that uh, FSO and terahertz can uh, kind of uh, coexist or can collaborate in a nice way since terahertz uh, can be affected by rain whereas FSO uh, tends to be uh, more affected by fog. Uh, so bottom line, uh, a hybrid FSO uh, terahertz system can be one way to achieve uh, high-speed uh, uh, communication in a reliable fashion. So let me stop at this point to stay within the time allocated to me, hoping that I will have an opportunity during the question and answer session to talk a little bit more about the coexistence of RF and terahertz system and the coexistence of terahertz and FSO system. Thank you again for your attention.